No, we've begun, so I'll do the intro now. Okay, good. guys, I'm here with Hunter Jefferson, who is a university student doing economics, who has written a paper on the relation of Proudhon to Keynes. Uh, can you explain how one of the foremost, you know, liberals of the 20th century is related to an unfortunately obscure French anarchist? Oh, yeah. So um, John Maynard Keynes um, is related to Proudhon in large part to his relationship to Silvio uh, Gesell, who was a German um, socialist who had a very nuanced view of how to take care of the issues in capitalism. So um, Gesell had actually previously seen Proudhon as his predecessor. And the funny thing is that all three of these thinkers had seen themselves well, especially Gesell and Keynes hadn't themselves actually seen themselves as going off of the others because they didn't know about their work before. But then after they had read, after they'd come to their own conclusions, they looked back and found these other thinkers like Proudhon or Gesell, and they realized, oh, wow, they actually had these kind these views that were really useful. So the relationship kind of coming from Proudhon up to Keynes is that Proudhon uh, was trying to deal with the issue of interest and the kind of um, the like best way to say it is unearned rents. Yes, yeah, it, unearned rents, and um, especially when it comes down to interest, um, his view was, you know, if we can get rid of interest, this will kind of resolve some of the worst parts of capitalism. And you know, he was a fan of markets, and especially in his general idea of revolution, and then. 19th century he puts up a program it's addressed to the bourgeoisie and he's putting forward a program of a people's bank and his argument is if we can bring down interest through this bank um we'll be and just have it be interest being the cost of the banks maintenance operations etc uh you can resolve and interest is flowing f freely i mean um the credit is flowing freely then you're able to get a situation where uh, you still have the market, you're still getting profit from, you know, exchange of goods, but it's always when new products are being made or when someone's actually winning in the market and, st and instead of r interest kind of, you know, allowing people to live as, you know, the inactive um, capitalist or rent rentier, um, you can get rid of that class. You can resolve the fact that people were getting poorer and poorer. And it's also geared to explain, to try and deal with why the economy of um, France was busting. Because in his argument, uh, the problem with rent was that as long as you keep uh, uh, the problem of interest and rent, but rent's a separate, separate issue here. <laughs> um, <laughs> He's, he, he has his whole other take on rent, which is similar, but I think interest is here where, when we're discussing case. Yeah, yeah. Um, the problem with interest is that over time, uh, workers, especially if they're having to take out capital or if they're having to you know, live off of the interest of capital that the capitalist is providing, um, they're always going to end up becoming poorer and poorer. They'll be owing more and more to the capitalist through production or... The capitalist is going to get to a situation where his workers can't survive off the off the wages because they are having to, you know, take out credit to buy goods or having to um, live, you know, on less and less subsistence wages. And so Proudhon's answer to this was uh, the People's Bank, which would only have the cost of operation as the interest, quote unquote. And so he saw this as getting rid of the usury aspect of interest. And he came to this because he says, because in his argument, he he believes, and this is an argument that he has with um, J.B., I mean, with um, Bastiat. Yep. And I actually read through the letters between him and Bastiat because he had a public debate in one of the large socialist papers of the time. And his argument was, okay, back in the day, you know, uh, early early when you know the mercantilism was was occurring 
and throughout the you know 18th century mm. interest made sense because of the likelihood of failure so you would have interest in the case of shipping because you didn't know if you know shipwrecks were going to take out the boat and all the goods and other issues like that could occur and his argument is that by the middle of the of the 19th century that kind of issue is no longer present and so the question of whether there are funds for credit, whether there are funds to exchange is no longer necessary. And so interest was not, it wasn't a question of whether interest was ever valid. It was just that interest was no longer valid. It had run its course. Now there was enough credit, there was enough exchange, the market was cohesive enough that this question of unpredictability, at least in that, in that aspect, had, had gone away. And so that leads us up to Silvio Gussell, who said, well, you know, instead of trying to make goods, trying to um, equate everything, let's try, instead of just getting rid of interest, let's make money fungible. He saw this as kind of like an intellectual uh, movement away from Proudhon, but also inspired by it, because his his point was still, we had this interest, this level of interest. Mm. And Gussell's argument, view was, the reason why interest is, is persisting is because people can hold on to their their money you can have Mm. the hoarding effect kind of the thing that um rothbard and mises say wasn't being done you know that (laughs) that um people weren't what they say isn't being done that causes the you know depression or recession he says because that's not being because that's being done at this time because people are holding on to cash and the cash isn't um going back into the market um, that's why you have these recessions is why you have the disparities of income because you have those people who are basically hoarding it. And so his argument was instead of let's, instead of the, you know, trying to regulate it with a bank, um, the interest instead, let's try and make money. Let's bring money down to kind of the, the level of non-durable goods, and so his scheme was money had to be regularly stamped in order to maintain mm. its whole value. If you didn't get it stamped within a certain period, it would actually decrease in value. And so it was kind of this view of, okay, as long as money is circulating in the economy, then you're actually having your, the, you know, it's a lot less likely for there to be a, you know, a secession of spending. And then we move on to Keynes and Keynes, he, you know, he has his whole theory of, you know, liquidity preference, the fact that, you know, money is always more, is always more preferred because it's more liquid. It's easier to exchange. You don't have to, you know, take it out of an investment. Yeah, you're good. Uh, So, so like preferred over like other, uh, like goods or services. Yeah. Well, it's, it's the preferred mon. It's out of all the way, all of assets and all ways of exchanging, it's the preferred for, uh, medium of exchange, cold, hard cash, because, mm. um, you can, you spend it right then. It's not like having invested in stock or whatnot, because yep. in stock you have to, you know, wait, it has to be a good day on the market to sell the stock and then get what you got back from the stock and you don't know. So, um, because of that liquidity preference, the, preference of the population usually to cold hard cash that was one of the that was one of the issues of why um employ you can get to full employment most of the time or lower the interest rate and so his argument was if we were able to lower the interest rate and of course in Kansas view you need the state to do this Mm -hmm. um if you're able to bring the interest rate down um and maintain a full employment you would be able to get the same kind of result as Gisell was trying to get And in Keynes' view, it's very similar to Proudhon's, except in Proudhon, he was eventually trying to get rid of the state. And in Keynes, he thinks the state's always going to be necessary, but it can actually bring about kind of the same result. You get rid of this rentier class, it becomes just the market forces at hand, and you're able to resolve those worse aspects of capitalism. And I'm just terribly sorry if I've uh, spoken too long on that. <laughs> no, 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 no. That's that's perfectly fine. Um, yeah. So this is all a very you know interesting model. But um, it seems to me because I like I kind of started this podcast because um, I'm you know interested in like questions of like limited knowledge and complexity and all that. It seems to me that like all of these thinkers kind of sidestep that question and that's not, you know, exactly like 
a deep cut against them. Most people from this time didn't like really address these questions or they didn't, you know, have the framework for which to view them. Uh, but that seems to me to be like a pretty significant problem. Proudhon, you know, his argument for like, oh, you know, we've gotten rid, rid of like shipwrecks, therefore, you know, interest is no longer a problem. Um, I mean, that's certainly an argument for lower interest, but I don't think it's an argument for like getting rid of interest at all. I think, you know, I think there are like epistemic limits to what we can know that mean that there's always going to be a degree of risk. Uh, wh what do you think about that? Um, I think that for Proudhon, it wouldn't just be the matter of risk. I think it, it kind of the amelioration, amelioration of risk, um, depending on the complexity of the society at hand, um, is kind of the question. And also, um, as to the knowledge, I think you're right. I think um, most of these most of these authors are not as interested with that kind of epistemology. Mm. Um, I think that they're um, though you know it is. I think that they also realize that the market is something that that, that you can't get rid of. You know, um, yeah. because out of you know even even you know of course Proudhon is the is the anarchist here, but. Um, Funny enough, I think um, Keynes actually termed used the term once um, of liberal socialist, and it's interesting because I think they all because I think they all understand that the market there are so many parts of the market that you can't get rid of or that or that mm. are just too useful, etc. Um, that their real goal is to let what are the worst aspects? What and for especially, I think Gassel openly says this. He's opposed to Marx. You know, he's an, he's opposed to a lot of the state socialists yeah. that are active during the time that he writes. Because I think it's the I think it's I think it's the early 1900s, like the first within the first decade that he publishes his major work, The Natural mm -hmm. Order. Um, and so I think what they're trying to do um, is find and point out these worst aspects of capitalism of the market that seem to have developed and try and deal with them present ways to deal with them that that can off kind of offset the what the growing socialist movement was i, I know keynes for example was really troubled by russia um hmm. in the 30s is what i guess he was pretty um aware of the purges and whatnot Gisell is in, you know, he's a German and he is, he, I think he's moved back to Germany in the early 1900s when he writes the natural order. So he's seeing, you know, the German SPD yep. and the different movements that are going on across Europe in the communist movement. And then Proudhon, um, you know, he puts the idea of the people's bank, which is where he put forward the idea of the bank that would only charge the cost of um, overhead, basically. You know, he's also writing, he, he's addressing that to the bourgeois. In fact, the book opens up with his passage and he says, to the bourgeois, this is something that you need to consider because if you don't consider this, things will get out of hand. Mm. And, you know, I think, I think he was pretty, he had a lot of foresight in that respect. But, you know, I think that the point that they're all trying to do is say, is trying to at least give ways in which you can maintain markets but kind of get rid of the worst aspects and so it's the social doctor and i think um they're at least in Proudhon's view i think his view would probably have um been pointing out that if we don't do something especially because you know he's not I don't, I don't know you know france is still coming into its full industrial degree mm. when he puts it forward it's not you know it's not as it's it's not at the point of england fully yet at the time that he's writing. So I think he's trying to run ahead and he's trying to say, Hey, these are things you at least point out. This is something you've got to address. Um, because he was, he wrote that, I think after the 48 revolution. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's all trying to deal with what they're seeing as these emerging issues that if not taken to, you're going to have those work, you're, you're going to deal with the, you know, the Marxist, you're going to be dealing with the state socialist and for Don, especially is dealing with, um, I'm trying to think of, He's dealing one of the major, I think, Blanque, Blanqui is oh, yeah. one of the ones yeah, yeah, he's, yeah. he's yep, dealing yep. with. Yeah, he and he and he goes back and forth with them many times. Um, the different, I think, one of them had been involved later on in the sixty-seventy-three revolution. Um, <laughs> so 
you know, <laughs> there. So you know, a lot of this is dealing, trying to at least give out ideas, trying to put forward options that have not been addressed, and you know, try to go from there. Mm. Yeah, yeah, no, that that definitely makes sense. Um, yeah, the nineteenth century was a pretty crazy time. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. Well, and I think there's something to be said to that. I've heard a number of people say that, you know, in a lot of ways there are still issues from the 19th century that still haven't been resolved. And I Mm. think, I think in some ways that is that there are certain areas where that is still true. Because I think that even today, and that was one of the things my, my paper focused that, you know, we're still dealing with this today. We're still, you know, Thomas Pick. Piketty is the kind of the most the most recent yeah. person in economics that put out a major work on that. But yeah. these issues of disparity of inequality in the market system is yeah. just well, I mean like that we still have to deal with. Yeah, I mean like also like David Graeber's debt, which you know yep. was like not very focused. Uh, I don't think you'll mind me saying that, but you know it was like uh, <sighs> no. like the final section was like you know talking about how we're moving to like this new sort of well uh like by moving to like fiat currency uh we're like sort of like going back to this you know old like he he like sort of like paints like you know these very like macro level cycles that go for like hundreds or thousands of years depending on like what forms of Mm -hmm. money are being used um and I can't remember it, but like, you know, yeah, it, like it clearly, clearly has some reference to the world we live in today. Oh, for sure. So I, I want to take change track slightly uh, and revisit some of yeah. like the points you were making, especially about like the, uh, like the socialists in Germany. Um, you know, the more like mm-hmm. uh, ones who, you know, liked who who saw like the emerging like concentration of industry um as potentially a good thing and and that also goes back to my you know concerns about risk and uncertainty mm-hmm. for example like the um the SPD i know you know it's it's, it's like uh, as like a group of intellectuals that big and you know as a party of like thousands strong um, you know, there's obviously like a lot going on there, but like one of their assertions is that they believe that Marx was correct about like the concentrating uh, tendency in capitalism and that this would quote unquote socialize industry by like bringing people together and creating yeah. the hierarchical firms that are really, really big that, you know, they thought could just be like transferred to some sort of like democratic or workers control. Um, Mm -hmm. And I think, I think that's like a, I think that's like a really, I think, I think like the conflict between that and Proudhon who, you know, really emphasized a sort of more like a decentralized craft work model. um, I think, I think that is Mm -hmm. like one of the most interesting uh, intellectual conflicts over you know this direction of what like i guess you know socialism whatever the hell that word means uh but like which way it would take um because Mm -hmm. it also intersects with you know like broader geopolitical shenanigans to you know call world war one and world war two shenanigans um but like you know like the the like mass production uh required uh in like you know conflict um like clearly mm. ties into things um there's there was this essay by david graber in, in like 2002 uh where he, he points out that at the beginning of the 20th century most marxist parties were like increasingly becoming like reformist social democrats and it was anarchism uh and syndicalism that were you know the revolutionary left and then World War One came along and kind of like flipped it, and that was because uh, prior to World War One, and this might be common knowledge, I don't know, but like uh, everyone, everyone kind of assumed that like war between industrial powers was kind of not going to happen. It's over. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I, I think oh, I yeah. think I think like I think like that is something with the whole resurgence of radical and also kind of extreme politics over the last 
uh, mm-hmm. 10, 20 years aided by the internet. I think, I think like that is a point that gets missed by a lot of people um, because, you know, you've got like tankies who are like, oh, you know, anarchism mm-hmm. can't work. It can't defend itself. But we're clearly yeah. in terms of like production and in terms of like conflict, we are in like such a significantly different world. Um, so mm-hmm. with all of that, could, could you speak to any of that? Um, and, you know, since you, yeah. since you have like an understanding of economic history and economic thinkers, like, you know, mm-hmm. are there any like things I've missed that uh, would, you know, be interesting and support my argument? Yeah, no, no, um, no, a lot of that, a lot of that. So, and, and just, just to restate one more time, what is the kind of what your point and a, hey, all that stuff is very valid points on it on the situation um i guess when it comes down so, so we're talking about if there's gonna be resurgence of the war machine or or is no, it, no, is it just because Let of me... those elements that cause like kind of, yeah so i think i think there's like a really interesting like uh conversations to be had about how like the needs of the rule like the ruling class shaped like the direction of technology mm-hmm. and also but then how yeah. like the way the technology gets developed, like it's also, you know, it has to like, it has to also, you know, come to terms of reality. Uh, I think like the most Mm -hmm. clear example of this is like how the internet, which was developed in a very centralized um, time was still had to be decentralized because like, you know, the Mm -hmm. brute fact of like nuclear war made it so that they had to make it this Mm -hmm. decentralized thing, uh, despite the fact that, they obviously wouldn't want that and so i think i think just like there's like some really interesting tensions there and then the base of the technology that we use like obviously uh influences our like you know our day-to-day lives and our politics yeah yeah how how and how movements and stuff and how that kind of transfers over into the future and how movements look yeah yeah no i think that's i I think that's that's a very sorry and then one last thing one last thing before i let mm -hmm. you start talking um, I think I think there's also like a lag time between like technological reality and like people's sort of like intuitions or common sense notions about how things work. Um, and uh, you know, oh, yeah. going back to like online tankies, you know, talking shit. I think like a big a big a big thing there is just like yeah, there's this new interesting stuff, but it like hasn't become common sense enough to the point where, you know, people are just like, Oh, that's obviously stupid. You know, like despite Mm -hmm. all the, you know, fantastic advances and potential for decentralization. uh, The sad reality is, is that very few people actually experience that in like their workplaces or their schools or whatever. Um, Mm -hmm. I think like the only place that people really experience is interestingly enough, uh, like online like spaces for culture um which is like really Mm -hmm. weird because you know you have these like very sort of like rigid uh unresponsive bureaucratic institutions that we like hang out in all day but we're constantly you know on our phones or whatever like making like crazy weird culture um anyway (laughs) that's that's besides the point um but you get what you get what i'm saying at and i think um yeah yeah no no for sure if you could like add to that or like give me maybe counter examples but you know using your understanding of economic history i think that'd be great <laughs> of course yeah so i think i think that's a really valid point i think that you know in part capital and technology always seem to run in front of uh, keep ahead of the horse in a sense i think i think that um it's always something that the rest of us are you know trying to climb behind and especially in the socialist movements and anarchist movements it's always been one that you're trying to deal with and trying to conceptualize. I think, for example, you know, I think in part one of the reasons why Proudhon and you know doesn't kind of gets lost. You know, the truth is like when we look at Proudhon and kind of those early anarchists like Josiah Warren and even Benjamin Tucker, um, a lot of that history was lost. For example, is because I think that the technological changes, the economic changes they had been addressing kind of the earlier half of the 18th of the 1800s. And so one, I think one of the things that then move happened is that you then have Marx, you then had um, the shift to that communist side, because what they saw is what so many of the um, radicals at the time were seeing was 
kind of um, what Carson, I think, hints to is like the the Taylorist, the manager, the rise of the managerialist capitalism mm. of the late 1800s. That, in part, I think, also is kind of how why we see, you know, the communist movements of the time gear themselves to that. I think you know, Lenin is a oh, well yeah, known no. Taylorist, and Trotsky was too, and it's it's and they're just so they're so clearly because that's what they're seeing at the time. You know, it, it seems to that if you read in Lenin's Lenin's imperialism, um, that's kind of the situation he's seen, you know, and, and it, it, you know, you're talking about major corporations like um, standard oil, which at the time was beating out state run groups even um, at, in, in the market at different points. And so they're seeing this kind of managerialist for, firm that is showing so much um, agility and capacity to dominate the economy that they're kind of forming how they how they tackle the situation at hand um geared towards that and so then it becomes a matter of you know okay when you move forward how they're interpreting marx is also interpreted about okay what are our conditions and so that's kind of what i think that's probably one issue that you they can run into is is that you're gearing yourself to a part of the economy that may well shift in the future like we have now you know at, during the turn of the century, you're looking at high industry that required the means of production to be centralized, or most of the means of production had to be centralized because of the blast furnaces and kind of that heat technology that could only be done at that level. You didn't have the scale of electricity like we had. And so that's kind of why I think that part, I think that's in part one of the reasons why, you know, the individualist anarchists um, themselves fall to the wayside. And it's in, um, I think another move that, Another thing that you'd mentioned was, you know, kind of like the rise of syndicalism and anarchism and then kind of fell off after the First World War. And it's funny because um, it, I actually did a study during the First World War. And uh, if you look into the history of it, all the socialist groups that had been part of the international had gone in their own directions, had gone with their national, their what their, na- what their country had done. Um, when it came down to World War One, it was actually also this. It was actually the syndicalists um, and the anarchist groups that were the only ones that, in general, maintained, you know, internationalism, and which led to a, uh, a bit of repression and whatnot later on for them. Well, during the process too, and then kind of move, you know, moving forward. I think that's. I think in part one of the reasons why we've seen anarchism gain. Um, you know, more traction recently has been because we, because we're kind of living in a, like you mentioned that cybernetic world, this where the means of production and also kind of just the general existence that we're living is a, it's all online. It's pretty horizontal in a number of ways. You know, there, we do have hierarchies because of the platforms, but at the same time, the, the, the overall kind of guiding part of the, of the system is still so hierarchical. I mean, I see this every day when I work. You know, the firms themselves haven't fully moved in the right, haven't started to really change in that direction unless they're part of the more progressive side of things, which, you know, is is usually, usually the newer industries, the newer areas of the economy are usually ones that are the first ones to signal that change and the first ones to be acting in that way until, you know, that new epoch of technological and economic change has really gone throughout the entire economy. I hope that addressed some of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd um I'd also add um you can also see it a lot in like um you know conflict, uh mm-hmm. especially like insurgencies and stuff. Have you read John Robb's Brave New War? I have not. It sounds familiar, oh, yeah. but I have not. Yeah, yeah, no. Carson Carson cites um Robb a lot in his work. Um but yeah, no, he like he um he basically like articulates this sort of like form of open source warfare. Mm -hmm. Um, and he's like, yeah, like, you know, like insurgents in Iraq and Afghanistan, like, you know, they just converged on this because like they had computers lying around, uh, you know, they had like network computers lying around. They just converged on it because it works. And, you know, they're like, there are like some pretty frightening or interesting implications of this. And I think, I think like, one main reason for that is um, our economy, uh, especially in the West, is like really. It's it's really funny when like you know leftists talk about how like neoliberalism is about free markets, and then you know you go look at like the amount of regulations that are in the book, and it's just like a 
like kind of like a linear line um just going upwards from the 1950s mm-hmm. um yeah and i think like i think a big part of that is just um you know there was like a crisis of profit and since then it's and yeah this goes back to what you were talking about it's like uh various various mechanisms of rent seeking um mm-hmm. have been employed and yeah i think like that's a major reason why you know despite the obvious potentiality of alternatives um they haven't come to fruition because you can like implement it in like sort of a black market sort of way but like that's really risky and so that's why you know it's been like tech companies that are sort of less regulated although that seems to be changing unfortunately and then there's also uh you know like people people are like outside the system who you know don't have a reason to play by its rules are also sort of adopting some of this um yeah and like and like obviously you know like protest movements and stuff doing it to some degree the massive wave of protests that we've been seeing around the world in like the last two to three years is clearly an example of this yeah no and and i mean i think that all that kind of indicates that you want know, you know once again people are starting to grab onto the tools the new tools that are developing it's, it's starting to show the fractures in how these systems are working. I think that's what, I think that's kind of what's been started to become clear, um, especially to the leads. I think that they're, oh, they're yeah. watching this and realizing that um, new, new changes are going to have to be made. New ways of approaching these issues are going to have to be made. And probably that, I think that's why, why that like the tech companies, you mentioned mm-hmm. how they're getting more regulated. That, I think this is part of why I think it's because, they don't because the problem is you know how do you deal with all these disparate groups you know activists and whatnot at at best you can try and target some of the areas where they can where they aggregate so through the social media you know a lot of people think you know there are people who are saying oh well it's russia or whatnot um (laughs) and that's why they want to go after facebook or whatnot but i think the real reason the political uh minded reason is because Mm -hmm. it's become realized at this point that these are areas um the new technology, the new frameworks um, of disruption, have outpaced the system mm. enough to an ad- enough to a degree that they at least want to try and set some kind of um, boundaries, some kind of limitations where they can. Now, as to whether those will be effective, in this you know that's entirely up to that, that's entirely up to be seen at this point. But I think it's a, it's a, it's the demonstration that. It is in the mind of the elites. It is in the minds of um, the state of the government yeah. that um, these will have to be controlled to some in some way, or else things will get out of hand. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, although, like, it's it's like kind of crazy that it's sort of like you know this is starting to ramp up just when like America, you know, has like the one-two punch of just failing to deal with coronavirus and then also like massive protests um which you know from like a purely like uh material perspective probably doesn't matter that much because you know it's 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 targeting like the old and not to be callous but uh and the protests most likely in the short run will just cause like some minor reconfiguration you know uh i unfortunately don't think you know they're gonna abolish all of the police but from like a soft power perspective i think um i think it matters a great deal because um like one advantage that america has always had over russia or china um until recently is like it had this image in the minds of many people that you know like despite all its fucked up shit like you know, it was still something worth striving for. And I, I don't think that's like all cynical propaganda. Um, I do think like one of the reasons why the American empire uh, was, you know, able to deal with like a far more complex world than other empires was because there was like some legitimacy to the liberalism that it promoted, even if it did it in like this really like blunt and stupid way, like the freedom that it represented like there was something there and the failure of America to deal with, you know, uh, things and for it to get that bad, I think, you know, really discredits it. Uh, and I think, I think that's like a really, really big deal going forward. 
Oh no, I completely agree. And and you know, I think I think it's in, in part I think it's just be, I think it's because um it's kind of this encountering with all the things that had never been dealt with before, you know. Um mm. when it comes down to the Trump presidency, I think I think that you know what you had what you had was you had this, you know, this kind of you had a game being played with the Obama presidency in which, you know, the America tried to pose itself as, you know, the enlightened neoliberal empire. And I, you know, having been someone who had been the tea party actually during that time, I think what, what eventually came out was um, the underlying contradictions that had never been dealt with before the kind of inconsistencies um, finally had to find their way way out somehow. And it came out because of, you know, the successful loss of the GOP and kind of the the older upper middle class, you know, middle class, upper middle class um, that had felt like they had gotten, you know, the raw end mm-hmm. of the stick at, at that point. Now I think that it's all become very clear, at least it's, especially to the younger generation, that the the way of the, that that approach has gone out the window you know i think i think the two you know the the with both the pandemic and with the you know the 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 um protests and the riots etc has, has made clear that it, it can't mm. continue in this way anymore you know that um you know that uh, well, well i i at this point i expect mm. that we're probably going to get i hope so problem. god um because um, <clears throat> like the alternative is is increasingly looking like a civil war and like i don't know if the left can like win that right now maybe in like a decade or so <laughs> well and it, it, oh, god even thinking about it right now but you know about but it's the thing that even even the people that you know the the many people that are on the opposition now uh, the thing is is that you know who do we yeah. get we, we get joe biden and and there's a lot of there is a lot of anger about that there i i and i've known a lot of people who were your standard democrats who were you know fine with the conventional approach um last time around when it came to hillary um but now at this point even people who who were all supportive of her then i know a lot of them that are rather upset about this but it was because it was that you know the that fear of oh the radical bernie movement oh the you know the and also kind of an apprehension towards i'd say the the a, a revision of the enlightened liberalism that you may have seen with some of the other contestants that at this point it was whoever they can get on there that appears to be breathing <laughs> and may gain may gain the swing states that um were lost last time but now it appears that you know in, in honestly that the thing is is that i you know if if we talked back in january i would i, oh, yeah, I, I would have been pretty unsure about what was going to happen because you know it didn't it, i wasn't even you know at points uh, I'm not sure if old Joe is even breathing still, <laughs> but but I think that with you know the the pandemic, how poorly it's been handled, how kind of disconnected um, the regime is to the science of it, and when we're looking over yeah, Europe and, Asia. and seeing that Europe's doing fine now, well, we're the ones who are spiraling. Yeah, oh yeah, us and I mean Europe and Asia, you know, the rest of the world, in many places are doing a lot better. It's become succinctly clear yeah. to a lot of people that yeah. this is not working. But in my big, my biggest concern is that I th- is that I think that there are many people who sus- who are betting on oh Biden gets in, <laughs> things will be fine. But I think that from what I am seeing, people that yeah. were never political before are yeah. not going to cease it. And I think that the real conflict will be when, when if you know, when the powers change over, things don't change in any kind of dramatic way, or they're not evolved yeah. Yeah. beyond where we are now. That the the elites won't know what to do because <laughs> they don't want to go the way of the radical left, but they've already exhausted both. They you know they exhausted mm-hmm. the leadership when the, um and I think that's you know when when you have to when Hillary is your option yeah you've kind of exhausted that you know that and that and now they're putting up Biden who will probably only win because of how truly mm-hmm. mishandled everything has been so oh yeah no yeah just just like on like the failure of the pandemic like I think probably like the most mm-hmm. telling thing was um how people like over the age of sixty five uh like are now um 
majority supporting Biden, which, you know, like really just tells you just how, like, how much, you know, self-interest matters and Mm. how, like, one thing you really don't want to do is, like, kill people, (laughs) you know, unleash, like, a virus Mm. that, you know, like, targets old people. Um, I I really shouldn't be laughing at that, but, you know, it's just this amazingly beautiful fuck up um that is uh, oh god it's 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 just a giant train wreck um of train wrecks it's it's honestly quite impressive how bad they've managed to fuck it all up uh on both sides um anyway i so i i actually i actually think that um if the elites were intelligent i think what what they should have done was like let like bernie run and then um you know either a he loses uh to trump in which case you know that discredits like the popular approach to social democracy or like he wins but then you know he just doesn't have uh the support in like the senate or the house or whatever to get anything passed and then you know people just get frustrated and they like you know just like oh yeah you know like he's just another politician like he can't do anything whatever i think i think actually that would have been a more intelligent uh decision uh on their part Uh, probably but i think i think the fear has been that it doesn't appear that it is Mm. is, that it's contained to him and i think that's because i think i think new york i think that they were reporting that there are the number of people that have been you know connected to like the Mm. dsa or or declare themselves democratic socialists is Mm. they they have a record number right now who are all lined up who who took the primaries so i think i think the fear was Mm. that if you give it to them you you were you know and and i don't know if this is in this is probably a correct way of thinking but you know you're looking at balkanization because you know the the truth is is that the country when it, mm. it's only becoming more that very clear red that very clear blue and what do you do when you get that situation you know that either either you try and you know keep it as keep mm. it contained in those areas and if you let it go over to the you know if you let it go to bernie well i mean you've just ve- verified the fears of every yeah, every Glenn Beck, every Sean yeah. Hannity, every Rush Limbaugh um, that that has said, "Oh, they're they're just socialists and communists," you know. So I think I think they're still I think they're mm. still paranoid about that mm. a, a runaway effect. So it was probably you know it was probably in their best interest, um, at least in the short run, to you know maintain to make sure he didn't get in. Now, um, of course, there were, Bernie also did this poorly. I yeah. think there are a lot of issues with how they ran their campaign, but that, yeah. that's that's a whole other let's conversation. Not turn this but, um, uh, anarchist podcast into like normal yeah. electoral analysis. Exactly. <laughs> but uh, you know, in, in I think it is moving. It is in the mm. in a sense, so it is helping us out. I think mm. you know us on the radical left because the the more and more disenfranchised that they put that they mm. neglect reform the more the more they refuse to do it the more clear it becomes to other people i mean uh, let's be real if this mm. you know if we just oh think yeah four no. years ago God. four years ago you would never never have expected the amount of young people mm. the number of people that aren't even young that oh, are yeah, saying no. well, yeah. please never never yeah. you know it's it, it and it's and, it, and you know they of course there are a lot of people who who try to you know, come out and say, oh, it's, it's defund the police or, you know, we just want to, you know, move some of the spending. These were conversations that were never going to be had. And and um, that's why I think, you know, what we're seeing right now is is kind of the the hmm. the breakdown, you know, the the fracturing of the order yeah. of the system that we've got. And oh, yeah, no, I, no I'm not sure where it's going to go, but this is a, this is definitely our opportunity. This is where we start to you know push a people mm. ideas yep. conversations that wouldn't have been yeah, even yeah, possible yeah, yeah. i mean even with occupy you know occupy was was really minor oh, yeah, was, yeah, compared to this um and now we see such a resurgence that uh it's we're all yeah. unsure where things are going to be you know i i didn't expect i didn't expect the um i did not expect to see protests like this in any way shape or form you know, 
I thought I thought things weren't going to. Uh, so this has been surprising for me to watch, and exciting for me to watch and mm-hmm. be part of at different points. So, in some ways, yeah. it probably is a blessing. Yeah. <laughs> probably is a blessing that that you know the the social the the social democratic option mm. was nixed because now people realize that there is no mm. safe option. Yeah. yeah, I think I think all that is like pretty correct, and um, you know, it's also like encouraging i i just want to also like asterisk asterisk it with like um you know we're seeing sort of similar Mm -hmm. things on the far right uh, especially among like kids um there's this um like sort of mainstream conservative millennial who i like uh called um Tanny Greer, who wrote this um, piece called Explaining Conservatism's Generational Civil War. Um, and in it, he's like, uh, he's yeah. like, you know, he like reviews a sort of like normy conservative uh, book for like policy wonky stuff. And then he compares it to like what's actually going on for like, you know, kids at universities who identify as conservative. And it's like, Oh yeah. You know, like they're into like weirdo online, um, uh, you know, politics like bronze, bronze age pervert or like near reaction or like, uh, Catholic integralism or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, but then you have to like also keep in mind that like I've seen, um, you know pew research polls of like generation z and even like the people who identify as conservative like overwhelmingly liberal on a whole bunch of things so i don't know what exactly is up with that but i think like a general effect of the internet is you know all these gatekeepers are being abolished and as a result we've got this sort of flowering of ideas that is at both once wonderful and also somewhat terrifying (laughs) um Oh, incredibly so. I mean, I mean, I, I, I would definitely say that because you know, part of my, part of the reading and research that I've done in um, social theory, etc., and philosophy, uh, has actually come because I, at different points, I was watching mm. kind of that new right. You know, the new radical right. There was oh a, yeah, there was a yeah. new absolutist that I used to watch on YouTube. Yeah, I think I know that guy. And deleted everything. I think. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> in Australia, but I wanted. To, I, there are things. <laughs> he, he he's cleared everything, which I thought was very funny. Cleared everything. He's telling people to take down anything of his now. But um, it's it's been interesting because I think it's it, and I think it's kind of it has been in part thanks to the to the internet. It's also in part because I think options mm. and reliability of the standard approaches of both the right and left have failed. You know, the truth is, is that the market has only gotten worse. And I think, you know, that's something that has incensed yeah. both left and right, you know, both left and right. You can only push um, mm. the paradigm of yep. neoliberalism for so long until the reality yeah. of the situation is so po- is so far from um, the, the, the the theory. And so you know on the right, mm. you know I, I started out on the right. I, I grew up as I grew up as Republican. I, I was watching Sean Hannity and Bill O'Reilly at ten. So, so as someone who's been there and seen that and and realized that if I had gone a different direction, um, I would probably have leaned. I you know if things in my life had gone very differently and I hadn't been in situations that I was, you know, the, it, I could well have ended up in that alternative. Right? I, like I said, I was in the I was in the Tea Party. Um, I was a libertarian. <laughs> I, I met Ron Paul. <laughs> I met Ron Paul. He's the one who got me into Austrian economics. He told me to go read Rothbard uh, personally when I was in his office, and you know that's where a lot of those you know alternative uh, the 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 new right yeah, has yeah, come yeah. from. A There's, lot of them um, were from what I've seen were former yeah, there was that, um, libertarians. Article, sorry, there was that article on, like, like, um, a couple of years ago, like the libertarian to alt right pipeline. Um, I, I I like um, mm-hmm. Jason Lee Bias. Uh, uh he he quipped that it was actually the libertarian to you know radical politics like pipeline because you know it also turned out that like a bunch of socialists and like other weirdos had um also started libertarianism and gone somewhere else anyway oh no no and it's it's true you know because because libertarianism you know you get out on that end and i think what happens is that at least for me what i saw happen was 
when I started to find myself, depending on what you found yourself in, I think can kind of condition you towards one of those. So I found myself as someone who um, ended up moving to the left in part oh, yeah, no, definitely. in terms of my sexuality. And because, yeah, and so and so that gave me a glimpse for the first time as being like, oh, wow, I'm, I'm a minority. I'm, I'm I, you know, these are there, some of these things that have been told me were right. And so I ended up moving... Uh, right when I got into college, you know, as mm. I finally start to be myself and act who I was, I uh, I started to move farther to the left. That's when I read, started reading Carson. <laughs> I, I can't even remember how I came on this, but I got into his stuff, and then I and then I was like, well, you know, I never read. I, I've heard of this Kropotkin guy. Let me go read this Kropotkin guy. So then and then I then I find myself an anarcho communist, and then you know I couldn't find too many anarcho communists in my city so i was like so i saw a sign for a poster for a socialist meeting so i went to the socialist meeting uh six months later i am <laughs> part of the trotskyist group <laughs> i'm up in chicago at the largest trotskyist so like meeting people. in the country uh meeting the founder you'd actually be surprised and they're actually anarchists there too because it was a conference and over here we had this thing called socialism that it was a year and there is there were um anarchists there who i also discussed and i got into but um they were you know they were there were differences there i was i still wasn't educated much on like your like um the social the yep. the communist side of anarchism um because i've only gone through kropotkin but um then next thing i know i'm in charge of the of the organizational group for the for uh the <laughs> iso on campus at my college <laughs> i'm the chairman lined up to become in charge of this whole group and then i and then i was reading carson and Proudhon, and at the end of the year i was like oh my god i'm still an anarchist i can't do this i don't want to be in charge of anyone no <laughs> no leadership <laughs> but but no i think i think there's something that like, back to what jason Baez was right i think that um libertarianism that line yep. gets you out away from standard politics and it was the most accessible line unless you're someone who is already brought in from like the democratic side and over there you can only go so far um until you get over into the left i think too into the radical left but no it's 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 an interesting phenomenon for sure and we've seen it come up so many different times now Though I have to hand it, hand it to Jeffrey Tucker. He, he did a pretty good job, I think, at trying to maintain his line. Yeah. Oh, especially on, like, COVID. Stuff, but he was... I, yeah. Let's oh, my God. Don't, I don't even want to start with him. <laughs> but, but you know, like, his, his, oh, yeah, his yeah, yeah, calling yeah. out Richard yeah, Spencer yeah. and stuff like that, I think, was really, was really pivotal to making sure because i think that i think that was a problem i think there was an existential problem for for them and i think he helped guide he helped set the line for which libertarians and anarcho-capitalists could still kind of maintain their independence from mm. the two dividing lines you know and he, he did a really good job with the brutalism and uh thin I, uh, thin libertarianism and brutalism I, I can't remember what the exact term he, he had an essay that also came out a little bit before then all right wow so we've been going for almost an hour um is there anything else you want to talk about or i mean i'm open to anything i i i didn't have much more planned you know i've done i had done some research on well rereading re some of the prudon stuff but also, I don't want to keep you too long. I don't know how I, I've not been able to listen to any of these yet. How about you tell us like what what was like the tea party like um, from you know like the ground up? I think that'd be really interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. So um, so so on the tea party. So I actually got in there. I think I was in ninth grade. I was like fourteen or fifteen, and I got involved because. Um, I'd first been a fan. I'd gotten into the Founding Fathers, and then I got into Thomas Paine, then I got into Ayn Rand, and then I got into Ron Paul. And I think it was around when I got into Ron Paul in ninth grade that I heard about the Tea Party. And, you know, I was listening to Glenn Beck, too, at the time. And so I went to the first meet. So I went to a meeting. I No, I actually found out about a trip that they were going on. They were going up to Washington. And it's interesting because what it was, what it was, is it had been started by um, these older, kind of like upper middle class women. They had gone together, 
And they had started just having these monthly meetings. And it was about, you know, different Republican meetings. But it was, but um, they would do these trips up to D.C. And they were all being funded by um, yep. Coke, Coke Brother Inst- um, organizations. And so my first real experience with them was I went up, was they were having a trip up to D.C. And they were going, it was against the Affordable Care Act. I, I think it was... I think it was a little bit before it was being passed. I don't think it had fully gotten passed yet, but it was um, in relation to that. And basically it was lobbying. You went up there, you were at a protest or whatnot, but it's very, it, it was a very disorganized protest. You know, what, it's, it's always been funny to see that kind of thing versus your leftist protest because on the right, <laughs> people really don't know what to do. <laughs> <laughs> like 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 everyone's doing these crazy things like we had the guy who was dressed up as like a revolutionary war fighter and then you know they we, there was a big fight because someone had brought like an impeach him sign and then funny enough they were po- the the organizers were not having that they weren't a fan of the impeach obama um uh line or signs <laughs> so they they actually nixed that but um you know we were there for like an hour and it's pretty disorganized a lot of people standing around there's a speaker i can't remember who it was someone it was someone up there maybe michelle malcolm or someone along those lines and um so went there you know stood around not very not, not a lot of energy just everyone kind of like oppose obamacare and then we went to lobbying and so met with, you know, we're supposed, we went up to the state, um, to the, uh, Congress, ran into representatives. Um, and then I was, I, I, the, my two chaperones, this great elderly couple were like, well, we talked to everyone. I was like, yeah, that was like 30 minutes, an hour. We're here till like five o'clock. We have four hours left. So I was like, <laughs> let's go see if Ron Paul is in office. <laughs> <laughs> so we actually went over and I got to speak to him and then oh, I saw Rand, Rand and then went down and talked to Rand Paul. But um, you know, oh, right, right. Like anyone, you can say whatever you want about um Ron Paul, but like oh, Rand yeah. Paul is just yeah. horrible. Like holy, holy hell. Um, but you know, after after all that, you know, we'd have these monthly meetings, and it's interesting because it was it was in large the elderly population you know it was mainly your 50s to i think i think the oldest one was like 96 showed up to every meeting showed up at every meeting i didn't know if at points i wasn't sure if he was gonna like (laughs) you know survive the meeting but you know it was was all about this it it was really in a reinforcement of patriotism and then i think after a couple months so this would have been getting close up to the Mm. midterm elections I think um, that's when you started seeing kind of the politicians start coming around. And it was funny because, like, I was the youngest person there by far. Like, um, it was, and I think that was the one thing that I, that um, maintained itself is that in general, people in the Tea Party, from what I saw, were usually not young people. It was always, you know, 50 or older. And if they were there, if they were younger, they're usually extremely religious, um, but it was an interesting experience because they because they definitely did. You know, I, I realized after the fact that in part, in some uh, ways, I was kind of being groomed. Like they, right, they yeah. wanted me to get into politics. Um, but you know, if, as someone who's that young and was interested, um, well, I had a lot of really cool experiences. I, I met a lot of different people. From I actually met <laughs> Andrew by Breitbart Whoa. before. He asked. That's crazy. I have a photo with him. Yes, I have a photo with him. It was like six months before he passed, but it was at another one of the Coke fa- Coke um, Brothers. Um, uh, mm-hmm. This one was like a conference up in DC, and it was and he was there. Herman Cain was there. Uh, Mark Levin saw him speak. Oh God! I met Dinesh D'Souza. I have a book signed by Dinesh D'Souza that he signed himself in front of me and my brother um so yeah it, it was an interesting thing is it because um because so much of it was being like mm-hmm. preordained what you did before you got there you know which i've always found you know having been there and going to the leftist sp- space space oh yeah then, it's such a dichotomy you know it's such a dichotomy i think it's probably changed now because of how yeah, different yeah, yeah. the right is 
I think a lot of uh, I think a lot on the right has now moved, especially with the uh, you know the alt right. A lot of that was changed and probably moved more towards kind of your leftist yep, yep. self organization form. But during the Tea Party, it was it was one which you could kind of see who was mm. guiding it or who was preparing it because they had Americans for Prosperity. I think was a big uh, had a big hand in a lot of it. And and then in local politics, I mean, it was really effective. And I think that's probably you know the kind of move to the right. A lot of that wasn't was started then, because um, that's where all the Republican all the Republican uh, nominees in my county and state, a lot of them came to our area to our monthly meetings, and like there were meetings of about seventy, maybe a hundred people. A big, a big fish fry restaurant. <laughs> They're giving their presentations and kind of get out to vote. But um, that's where a lot of your, your farther right, not alt right, but your farther right politicians were, you know, stumping because they were active. I mean, I manned the phones for. Um, oh wow! The 2012 election. Yeah, I mean, I, I manned the phones. <laughs> at least I was really bad on the phone at that time. Um, I mean, I did it for a while. I mean, like Romney, Um, uh, as far as Republican politicians go, Romney is probably like the most respectable, um, which is not a compliment at all. But oh, oh, for sure. Well, and and to be honest, I think that in part is it is not you know a a primary explanation, but I think it's Mm. part of the explanation for Trump. I really do. I think that because I think with Romney's loss, I think there was Mm. this kind of dissolution in the sense that they could get away, that they could that that a clean cut, straightforward, you know, um, Republican of that type was going to win. I think I think that he was kind of and, and, you know, I think that I Mm. think that was in part the turning point. Um, where they realize, okay, we've 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 won the house. We've we've pushed, you know, our most um, cleaned up and princed politician, and he's still lost. And now, and that's where I think these alt right, oh, yeah, yeah. the, you know, the racialists um, started to see the cracks because they realized you had had so much momentum about that election. You had to put so much energy, mm-hmm. and then they're still lost. So. Yeah, I think that I think there's something to be said about mm. how that was kind of a turning point to the radicalization that that yeah. has occurred. I think also a, another right. part of it is um I know there was um I can't remember what exactly it was, but I'll put it in the show notes. There was like a a sort of memo or like a you know autopsy of the campaign, and like uh you know from the Republican side, mm-hmm. and they were like, oh yeah, like if we're gonna be relevant in the future, like we kind of need to you know embrace like expand like the minorities that we appeal to um and they're like you know there's like really good like reasons to do this you know like um uh like uh latin americans like you know like they're like pretty conservative um and they you know uh, uh yeah so like we could do this um and i don't know if um i don't know like how much that had an effect on like you know like the right wing media sphere, sphere and all that, but um, I think I think like a lot of you know, like back in twenty sixteen, there was like you know the term like conservative, you know, like oh you're selling out like our principles and our race or whatever, um, and I think that um, you know even if they didn't know that was happening, I think like people sensed it and they're like oh you know we're like becoming a minority and you're like all the urban educated people already vote like Democrat um so you know like if we're gonna if the republican party is gonna survive like it needs to start appealing to these people oh shit like we better get serious about you know like making sure that this doesn't come to pass oh no i i I agree and i think that um i think it's gonna be interesting because i think what you're gonna see in the next couple of years is I think everyone's been worried about the Dems. I don't think the mm. Dems are going to change. I think the Republican yeah. party is going to be looking very different in the next couple of years because, because I, I think what's happened is that there has been this long-term bet about that has been based off mm. of who their voters are going to be. And the fact is, is that the voters that they've got um, 
have shifted, I think. And the fact is that with, you know, I think that part of what we have today is because it's kind of the last gasp of yep. a generation. I think it's I think it's the last gasp of a generation that afterwards isn't going to be viable because, you know, the social conservatism is as far as I can see it dead. I, I don't I don't see how anyone I don't see how they can really uphold that any further. So it seems like their options in the future are going to have to move towards something different and uh, to be able to keep up this kind of binary system. They're going to have to reconfigure how that reconfiguration looks. I, I'm not sure it may still be based on kind of Trumpian lines because that's what's I think they we just had the election of like the youngest congressman in the in the history of the country, um, actually out of my state, western side of my state, oh. actually a year younger than me, which makes me feel old. Yeah, yeah. But um, that happened. He's a Trumpian. So, you know, how that's how everything's going to change and look in the next um, five years on that side. I'm I think that's going to be oh, yeah, more yeah, different yeah. than whatever. Happens I mean, on the left, yeah, I think I think like the institutional left, I think, like, is going to be very rigid. Um, mm -hmm. uh, although, like, we might because I think like one thing that might change is um, I think we might finally start getting some climate action because like the costs of renewable energy have gotten so cheap that you know uh and also mm -hmm. i don't know like a whole bunch of other reasons but i think like i think that's gonna be like quite rigid um i think i think like outside of that though like sort of like the activist um area i think i think there's like gonna be a lot more uh i mean i mean i think that's gonna be like still very fluid i think especially because um as we've seen with like the global global wave of protests i think like innovations in one country can quickly spread to another and so you know even if like all the americans in the left they're all all lefty americans like you know just like fell asleep for like a couple of years um you know there's still like innovation happening outside and ideas can travel across boundaries like very quickly um and i i think like i think that is you know like Again, it's like ecstatic and terrifying at the same time because like good things can spread really quickly and so can bad things. Mm -hmm. Oh, incredibly so. Incredibly so. Um, and that's why I think I think on the left mm. we're gonna see is probably more of a technocratic change. I think um because I, I, because it appears to me at least, um while we do have, you know, the the dramatic economic disparities the one group that has been at least attenuating to that has been or at least like trying to voice to that has been kind of mm. the the more progressive tech side um upper class and so i i suspect that in the next couple of years what we're going to end up seeing is that they the dnc will be kind of configured between kind of this more progressive you know, probably more than Obama, progressive um, green side, but also mm. with this kind of technocratic um, capital side, because I don't know if the two is that seems to be where they're heading. I, you know, it seems to be the uh, avenue that they can actually continue and sustain because they still need part of the mm. upper class to maintain themselves. Um, but I think that the older side is going to continue you know, on the right, because they've kind of lot, because you can't have a Bernie Krent side of the party and not at least have, you know, your donors and whatnot being at least somewhat open to that kind of reform. Yeah, I mean, like, to a certain extent. I mean, like, so, you know, like, we'll see. The, we'll definitely like, see. At the end of the day, but... like, the reason the New Deal happened was because, like, the elites were terrified of labor action and they were like, oh, we can buy, like, you know, these radical unions off with, you know, goodies. Uh, and then we can like go off the, the radicals. Um, mm -hmm. so yeah, like, you know, that, that, that could happen again. And that would be both positive and negative. One of the reasons I started this, um, show was I think, um, you know, I think we live in like very disruptive times and, um, you know, like we're going to sort of be doing a lot of fly by wire in the next couple of years, um, until we like figure shit out. And so, yeah, I, I, I just like, 
I don't endorse everything that's been said. Uh, in retrospect, I might look back on it and think like some of it's kind of stupid, but um, like that's just the way things work when you're in the middle of like chaotic times. Um, yeah, like like you you just you know like the situation is so complex and there's like so much uncertainty that you're just gonna make mistakes. Um, so yeah, uh, that of is course. that is my disclaimer. Um. And you should not take things we take seriously. Uh, you should, you know, sanity <laughs> check everything. Uh, yeah. <laughs> hundred percent. Well, I mean, I think it's the only safe thing to do right now. I mean, this, I, I can't, in my knowledge of American history and world history, I don't think there mm. has been anything like this since the sixties. I think the sixties were the last time, the, you know, in the sixties, early seventies was the last time that you had this kind of phenomenon where, it looks like there are, mm. are more fractures in the global system and in yeah, you know, yeah. national systems than ever before. And and it was and it's interesting too because it you know, I think I think what's been interesting is how they haven't been mm. like the Great Depression. Like in, in the past, usually this kind of si- this situation happens with like mm. a massive economic sh- you know shutdown, and yet in a in a sense you know mm. that that hasn't really occurred. I know that you know the virus has really slowed the economy, but the truth is is that you know, up until the virus, everything was yeah. moving along quite quite well. The econ- you know the fundamentals were good, um, growth was continuing. So it's 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 bizarre how like um, yeah it's not because of the economic system. And during the 60s oh, and yeah. 70s, and Graeber actually talked about this, is there was, um, he mentions that in the 60s and 70s, there was a shift, tech change, a shift in investment tech. And he talks about how, like, there was a movement away from, like, the mm. the factory automation. This is the flying is cars and declining rate of profit article, right? Book, this is the... Yes, yes. And he talks about how, like, there was that shift. And, and I find, and, you know, that... um. It was it was as if there was mm. a shift away from the flying cars from that kind of yeah. automated future to information technology, and I wouldn't be surprised. And I'm wondering if we're not seeing, while everything else is happening, if there is not going to be a similar kind of shift. If that's not, if we're not going to see another kind of diversion. I mean, like, in I mean, like one that's like kind of obvious um, is like the move to you know. Uh, like green energy both for like climate and cost reasons like um you know like solar and wind are like you know it's cheaper to build a solar farm than mm-hmm. like run a coal plant and like that that like i've 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 been trying to look into this and like there's like very little writing about you know the like consequences of that um and it seems you know like really massive uh, you know basically because like solar panels you know you can just chuck them on your house and then like suddenly you know you own the means of production for energy and like that's a really big deal yeah no for it it is it's 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 a game changer and you know that Mm. that along with the at-home production Mm. that is becoming more and more possible you know Mm. uh, and kind of the 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 hacktivism more and more you know that's why i've i've you know Carson, I, I continue to think is probably one of the mo- mm. one of the more most important things. <laughs> Thank God he's on our side, honestly, <laughs> um, because it seems like you know he, he's kind of given a lot of the guidelines, yeah, the opening yeah. area to think about how the material to start thinking about what's yeah. what is to what is to come. And you know, for me, the big thing is okay. How do we make sure that we how do we make sure that we get we are able to orient it towards yeah. our ends as compared to you know the opponent who yeah. Would try yeah. To or like you know like fascists help. who would just be like like autarky and you know like mm-hmm. crazy surveillance so like everyone's living tread lives or something yeah it's yeah it's it's really crazy mm-hmm. um all right i think um i think i think that's a good like ending point for this um yeah um okay so before we before you go um do you want to like um you know you know uh give you give you like spiel like tell us you know where we should go find you or like what things you're working on oh okay so right um right now i'm working on uh 
a bit of social theory and uh, some some uh, projects that I have in I have in that direction right now with a couple friends, uh, kind of holding that close to the chest right now. But um, I think the one place that I have that I can be reached at is um, at Mutual Revolts on my Twitter, and that's kind of that's kind of where I am now. Um, and also, thank you so much for you know ha- wanting to have a conversation, and bringing me on here. I really do appreciate it. It's been wonderful. Mm-hmm.